Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Let's Talk Privacy and Technology series. As you know, if you've been following us, we like to bring on guests in the intersection of privacy and technology. And we like to talk to things about things like privacy engineering, privacy enhancing technologies, privacy by design, privacy tech. And today is no exception. I am your host, Lourdes Turecha. I am the Privacy Tech and Law Fellow at Santa Clara Law's leading privacy law program. And today I'm really excited to have with us the visionary Lori Craner, who is the director of Carnegie Mellon University's Scilab Security and Privacy Institute. Hi, Lori, and welcome to the series. Hi, glad to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I, you know, I am familiar with your background at Carnegie Mellon, the FTC, and Wombat Security Technologies, but for the purpose of our audience, I would I would appreciate it and love it if you could talk to us about how you got into privacy and technology and then how you ended up here. Okay, let's see. Um, so I uh, was an engineering student um, and I did my undergraduate degree in engineering and public policy. And I started looking at policy issues related to the internet. And this was back in the early 1990s. Um, and um, Privacy was one of the issues that people were just starting to talk about. Um, and so I looked at that, I looked at security, I looked at internet voting. Um, I ended up um, getting a master's and a doctoral degree and my thesis was on electronic voting. And uh, then after I graduated, I went to work for AT&T Labs in New Jersey. And um, they uh, were looking for someone who wanted to get involved in a privacy standards group. And I knew a little bit about privacy, so I went and joined the standards group, um, uh, which ended up being a W3C working group, which uh, developed a standard called P3P, the Platform for Privacy Preferences. And I worked with a lot of really amazing uh, people who knew a lot more about privacy than I did. And, um, and they taught me a lot about privacy. I ended up chairing a working group there and um, yeah, doing, doing work in privacy. And then uh, after about seven years at AT&T, uh, I decided I wanted to go back to academia and um, I came to Carnegie Mellon and I have been doing research focusing on the human side of security and privacy. So it sounds like you've had quite the career in the intersection of privacy and technology and academia at the FTC and you know at a startup uh, and and with standards groups like W3C. So I'm assuming that you know, you're still here decades later that this is an exciting place for you, like many of us here um, on this call. What, what keeps you excited about privacy and technology? What keeps you, you know, here and not pivoting to any, to some other career? And, and what is it that um, makes you want to write the next article or, uh, you know, write the next piece or teach the next class in, in this intersection? And I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about what's exciting to you in this space? Well, I guess it's, there's always something new. Um, and yeah. so that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when I teach, it seems like every semester I have to like, you know, redo part of the curriculum, teach something different. And I, I would say, oh, if only I was teaching calculus, and that doesn't change, right? <laughs> you know? um, but, uh, but privacy changes. Um, there, there is a lot of new, new stuff. Um, and so that's exciting. Um, and um, now that I'm at a university, I just love working with students and uh, having the opportunity to see what their ideas are. Yeah, and I feel the same about that, about sharing with students and the, the point about there's always something that's new and changing. Yesterday alone, we had three relatively big things happen in the privacy world with the Irish GPC telling Facebook to stop their data transfers to the US and Portland banning facial recognition and Washington, um, you know, reintroducing their their privacy bill and so you're absolutely right there's also always something new and and i think that's also been true throughout the decades it's not just today and it's certainly picked up today uh and and so i i would love to pivot and and ask you about you know, knowing what you know now from your decades worth of work in privacy what are some of your predictions about the future of privacy in technologies and I'd love to 
kind of do the softball towards you know, our theme today, which is one of your visions for, for the future of privacy? Yeah, so uh, I guess the, the IAPP asked me this question a few months ago when they were putting together their compilation of, uh, of visions um, for the future. And so, so I'd given it some thought. And um, uh, I, I, my, my vision is a little funny because it's the same vision that I had um, 20 years ago <laughs> um, when I was involved in the P3P standard. And that vision is that we can automate a lot of privacy decision making. Um, so, you know, with the idea that, that we want to give people notice about how their data is being used and give them choices, um, you know, 20 years ago, people said, nobody wants to read those privacy policies. It's too many choices. Like, can't we have our web browser do it for us? And that was the inspiration for developing P3P as this automated tool to just read all those website privacy policies. And um, the idea was that, we, that your web browser would negotiate with websites in the background, have a seamless experience. Um, the standard came out, uh, it was adopted by a very small number of websites and it has long since gone. Right? So it, it didn't really uh, work, not because the technology didn't work, but there was just no incentive for adoption. So now um, it's, it's uh, 20 years later and people are saying, wow, you know, these, these privacy policies, no one wants to read them. And now it's not just websites, but all these IoT devices and, you know, every thermostat and smart light bulb, like they're collecting data and how are we supposed to know what they're doing? Um, wouldn't it be nice if some, someone could just read it automatically for you? And, uh, and so now, yet again, uh, people are saying, hey, automation, this would be great. And so, you know, my vision is, yes, let's automate all of this. Let's have agents, privacy agents that can help people navigate through all of this. And, you know, I should be able to say, hey, smart thermostats that are not actually collecting anything personal about me, they can go on and do their business just fine. I don't care. Don't, you don't even need to tell me they're there, right? But if I walk into a room and there's a microphone recording, I want to know about it, like now. So interrupt me and tell me. Um, and we, we can build tools to do this. We've built prototypes of this at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but uh, really, in order to have this vision realized, um, you know, we need to have the incentives so that you know, every device manufacturer adopts this. Uh, and every business you know, sets things up so that they advertise what data they're collecting and what, what's done with it. Um, and you know, it's, it's not clear how we get those incentives to align. So 30 years ago in the 90s, P3P was, you know, adopted by Microsoft and a few websites. It, it didn't take off. And, and it sounds to me that what I'm hearing from you say is that the incentives just simply weren't right. The idea was too early. Well, I'm curious, and I've, I've had this conversation with other folks, but I always want to hear, you know, what everyone has to say about this point. What makes you, you know, what are you seeing out there and what makes you feel that the timing is finally right? Like what are some of the indicators that you're seeing? And I'm happy to share some, some of the ones that I see too about why we're finally hopefully going to get there in terms of adopting these technologies. Cause you're absolutely right. It wasn't that the technology, the tech didn't work. It was just that uh, folks didn't want to, you know, the incentives weren't there. Um, and I'd, I'd love to dig deeper into that further and, and hear your thoughts about why it didn't work and why what's what's different now yeah uh, i thought a lot about why it didn't work um uh <laughs> and and i think part of it was that the original incentive was um largely driven by regulators who were putting pressure on the big internet companies of the time uh so those were companies like aol um, and AT&T um, and, and Microsoft, um, IBM was involved. Um, uh, so they were putting pressure on them. And um, I remember there were FTC hearings back in um, 1996, 1997, uh, where basically, uh, you know, Congress had asked the FTC, um, you know, do something about this internet privacy problem we just figured out existed, right? <laughs> um, 
and uh, and the companies felt like they had some solution and you know so their first solution was we're all going to write privacy policies because back then they hadn't done that um, and not only were they going to write them, they were going to post them on their website. And the privacy advocates said, nobody's going to read them. And so the companies came back and said, okay, we're going to have this standard and it will read it for you. Um, and so, um, you know, th that, was, that was the incentive. Um, the regulators, uh, especially the FTC at the time, there were some FTC um, uh, members who were very enthusiastic about that. Um, the standard didn't happen overnight. Um, and a few years later, as the standard was starting to near completion, by that point, um, the FTC was looking at other things and really wasn't paying attention anymore. Um, and then, you know, it was like seven years before the standard finally came out. And by that point, um, you know, there were other things that had become popular and um, internet privacy was, was not top of mind for the regulators. And so I think the companies were like, why should we do this? Um, you know, the perspective that I heard from companies was, um, I have to post a privacy policy, and then you want me to do this computer readable version. And what happens if I mess up and I say different things in English and in my computer readable version? Or, you know, I change my English version and I forget to update my computer readable version. Well, that opens my company up to more liability and what's the benefit to me? Why should I do that? And, and that, that's the kind of thing that I heard. Um, there were also companies who were just like, in my English version, I can be kind of vague and not real specific, but as soon as I put it in computer code, I have to be really specific. And um, <laughs> there was actually one company who had some low level employees who, who sort of inadvertently issued a white paper that said, you know, we don't want us, our customers to see all the gory details of our privacy policy. Um, so uh, yeah, they just didn't have the incentives to do it. So what's different now? Um, well, I think um, regulators are now paying attention to privacy again. So if we do this quickly before they get distracted, um, you know, there, there's a chance. Uh, but also I think we actually have privacy laws and we have privacy laws significantly in Europe and in California. Um, and uh, companies are realizing that they have to comply with these laws and if they're um, isn't some organized, coherent way of doing it, they're going to have to comply with a gazillion different laws. I mean, there are already lots of laws they have to comply with. And so I think it suddenly becomes more appealing to say, hey, there's just one standard way that we can communicate about privacy and we don't have to do it 50 different ways. I love your, you know, your description of how in the English slash legal uh, notice, you have this vagueness that companies were relying on, whereas when you're uh, translating that into code, you really have to be specific. And so there is that traditional tension of legal policy versus tech, you know, the, the high level vague frameworks versus the specific ones and O's. And, and I love that you know, I, I love that we ended up and, and we'll get further into that and talk about privacy engineering and how we bridge this, that gap. But I, I also want to take the time to agree, you know, today, yes, regulators are paying attention again. It's top privacy is top of mind again. And you're absolutely right that there are new privacy laws like GDPR and CCPA. Uh, but I've also seen more and more you know, development in, in customer and consumer privacy sentiment with, with users and also enterprise customers demanding these things. So I think there's the market side to it that was never there before or wasn't, it was barely there before maybe that could uh, help us get there. And I'm excited about that. Um, going back to the tension, I, how do you, you know, how do you, when, when you work on something in privacy, we know it's cross-functional. We know that it's not just legal. It's not just compliance. It's not just engineering, but it's this cross-functional thing. What are some of the, the skills that you teach your students or that you've picked up along the years that have been helpful in bridging this gap? 
Yes, yeah, for me, um, you know, I, I was educated in an engineering school. Mm -hmm. And when I joined this um, privacy working group, it was mostly lawyers. And the first thing I discovered is that we didn't speak the same language. Right? <laughs> um, and, um, and at first it was frustrating. Um, and until we learned to understand each other. And, um, and so I think one of the most important things that I've, I've learned is really how to listen and communicate um, and to communicate technical ideas so that it makes sense to lawyers and, and other people who are not, not necessarily technical. Um, and, and also to, to, to have learned, you know, just enough about the law to, you know, understand what they're telling me. Um, so I think that that was um, really important to learn. Um, and, it, and it helped that I had some very patient um, uh, lawyer friends to, to help me. Um, I think also there was some uh, kind of negotiation. Um, I think there it was often the case where the the technical people would come in and say, well, this is what we should do in this standard. And, and I see this also happen in industry and products. Um, and the lawyers say, no, you can't do that. Right. And, um, and the problem is often the conversation ends there, but it, it has to be a negotiation. And so being able to push back and say, okay, explain to me what it is, what, you know, what is the legal issue? Why is it I can't do that? Now let me figure out what I can do technically a little bit differently so that I avoid the thing that you're telling me is problematic and I can't do. Um, and so I think uh, being able to problem solve and negotiate and think creatively about trying to find solutions uh, is really important. In addition to all the nuts and bolts of, you know, specific privacy algorithms and privacy law and, and you know, FIPS and all that kind of stuff. I, I have to say that the skills that you mentioned are exactly the same one I've, I've had to rely on from the other side, you know, listening, communicating, learning more about the technical aspects to privacy. My first job out of law school was actually within the InfoSec group, not the legal group of a, of a company. Uh, so that that forced me early on to do that. So I, I, I get that, that it's, it's, you have to be curious and, and learn the, the other aspects of privacy that you may not be experienced or skilled in. Um, I did have some very patient infosec and engineering friends who also helped me along the way and I still do today. And you're absolutely right about negotiating and problem solving. And I, I hate it when someone says, no, without explaining why. I think we all have to get to the why first in order to be able to problem solve. But I, I love the, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy and I'm excited that we, we rely on the same skills to navigate this complex and cross-functional place. Um, I want to get further into, you know, your vision in, in 10 years. So it's exactly the same things, but I, I know we started with P3P and then 10 years later, we had Do Not Track, which also didn't take off. Uh, and then now we have some startups out there and researchers and technologists um, propose personal assistance. And I think what you're, what, you know, what you're proposing is a, a combination of, of those three, like get, if, if that's what I read correctly from your piece. Uh, and and so maybe we can, you can walk us through an example of what this would look like in a connected home. So, you yeah. know, I visit your home. Hi, Lori. I enter your door and. Right, right. So, like? so um, I, if we imagine that my home had all sorts of connected devices, which, which actually it doesn't, I have like the most unconnected home, but, um, <laughs> but, but we'll pretend it does. Um, and, <laughs> Uh, and so you might come to my home for the first time and you maybe have a smartwatch on and your smartwatch um, maybe starts to vibrate. All right. And so you take a look and it may tell you, um, you know, there, there are 37 connected devices in this house. Um, but good news, uh, Lori's actually pretty privacy protective. Um, so there's really only two of them that, that might cause you any concern. Um, 
and um, and and not only that, but uh, but uh, I your your watch already knows um, your preferences, and so it has actually um, signaled to my devices uh, how they should respect your data, and um, and since I'm pretty privacy protective, I've set my devices to accept your request, and everything's good, and we're done. Um, you might be out of cur curiosity say, oh my gosh, 37 devices, what on earth does Lori have in her house? And, you know, you could explore further, um, you know, on your watch and, and, uh, and, and your watch would, would then, you know, list, you know, what the devices are and, um, and what types of data they're collecting and, and, and what is being done with it. Um, so so that, that, that's the kind of scenario uh, that, that we're imagining. I like the idea that it's preset because that is one of the biggest complaints that users today have about just being bombarded with these notices or these pop-up notification cookie notice cookie cookie banners and such. So I, I think that part of the tech is important. Uh, the second part is probably the more important part that these devices are honoring your preference, your preset preferences, and that's something that we've seen, we haven't seen throughout the years, right, with the, with P3P and companies refusing to adopt do not track. I mean, yes, they, there's a small ask there where they, they say whether or not they have to disclose whether or not they adopt or they, they honor do not track signals. But that was, that was the most that they were required to do. And, and, and I would love for this vision of yours of this world where, you know, devices, honor consumer, true consumer preferences and, and, and do it in a way that is seamless. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, consumers are starting to demand that. And, and I hope that with new technologies out there, uh, with new privacy technologies out there, that there will be more and more adoption um, that we see. Do you, you know, what, do you think would be the biggest privacy hurdle or, or issue that, that we face in, in adopting this? Or just in general, what do you think is the biggest privacy or technology challenge of our time? Um, I'd also love to hear your thoughts about what's going to keep us from go getting there in 10 years in terms of automated privacy consent. Yeah, so I think the biggest problems are th the incentives and the legal issues. Um, I don't realistically see this getting adopted unless there is a legal mandate to do it. Um, with P3P, we, we spent years um, going around and saying that self-regulation was going to you know, solve this problem and that companies would voluntarily do it. They had all sorts of incentives to be good actors and show off their good privacy practices. And, it just didn't work. There, there were, you know, about a dozen companies who wanted to be good actors and got out there and said, we adopted P3P and everybody looked at them and said, what? <laughs> what did you adopt? Um, at one point, um, Bill Gates actually announced that Microsoft was adopting P3P and was going to build it into the Internet Explorer web browser. Um, I think he did it largely because the regulators were, were mad at Microsoft for something else. And he was like, oh, no problem. We'll do P3P. And they were like, oh, great. Microsoft's doing P3P. Um, and uh, Microsoft sort of did P P3P um, because he kind of sprung this on his developers the last minute. Um, <laughs> but um, but I, I think for the most part, um, yeah, companies didn't really have the incentives to adopt it. Um, the Microsoft P3P implementation actually brought, blocked cookies um, for third parties that didn't have P3P. So suddenly all the third party advertisers adopted P3P and Microsoft kind of was, you know, they're not a regulator, but you know, they own the platform. That was an incentive um, until these companies discovered that it was kind of a buggy implementation and it was really easy to route around it without actually adopting it. So that was the end of that. Um, so, you know, to make my vision happen, um, we, we probably need laws that um, either require or provide safe harbors or some sort of incentive uh, for adoption. Right. 
And how do we get regular? I mean, look at what's going on in Washington, in DC. How do we get regulators in the US in particular? Europe is ahead of it, you know, ahead of us. Uh, so how do we get how do we get them to pay attention? And I, I think part of the answer is by caring ourselves as consumers, right? And putting in that pressure and and putting, you know, to, Historically, we haven't been as interested in privacy. The research says research says that that's been changing, uh, and I, I hope that's that's correct. Right? We can put pressure on our online services and on our regulators, but but you're absolutely right that this is not going to get adopted adopted if if there's no legal mandate there. I do like the uh, the Microsoft platform analogy and it, it, it reminds me of what's going on today with Apple mandating its nutritional labels with with its app developers and and I'm that to me is exciting that you know it's using this position to to require more transparency and less tracking from its from its uh, apps on, on the iOS platform. What do you think of, of what's going on there? Do you think that it's a good idea? Do you think that it, it's, uh, what do you think of the, I don't know if you've had time to look at the nutritional the quote unquote privacy labels that came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, yeah, I was actually super excited um, when that <laughs> happened because um, my students and I basically proposed that idea a decade ago. And, yeah. um, and the folks at Apple actually read our papers and, um, okay. Uh, and I believe we're influenced by some of our work. It just took 10 years for anything to happen, right? right? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I continue to believe that um, those sort of privacy nutrition labels on apps, on devices, on websites, on any of these things are a good idea. Um, now, there is some uh, devil in the details. Um, so, for example, um, banks... Uh, have their privacy policies look somewhat like nutrition labels. And we did a study looking at those. And on the one hand, it's great that you have a lot of consistency in um, comparing bank privacy policies, but there are also some things about the format of the policy that are not as good as you, know, you might like. So um, being able to actually see the whole format and looking at, you know, what does it look like to consumers? Do they understand it? Um, and in the case of the Apple labels, um, it's also really important, what does it look like to developers? Are developers going to be able to fill it out accurately um, so that when a consumer sees it, it, it actually you know, reflects what's really going on. Um, so I don't have answers to those questions. Um, in theory, I think it's a wonderful idea, but I haven't seen enough of the details to, to fully evaluate it. I Absolutely, in theory, it, it's lovely, but I think it, we'll see, right? Like in a few months as, as they roll it out and, and we see whether or not developers, well, they have to adopt them and otherwise they'll get kicked out. But we'll see how easy it is for them to fill out uh, and whether they actually follow through with what they say and, and whether consumers find them easy to understand. So uh, I'm excited to start seeing them and to start <laughs> commenting on them. Uh, in addition to you know automated privacy consent and these privacy labels that we're starting to see and 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 those things, I'm curious, and as a technologist, technologist, what privacy feature or privacy technology do you wish existed? Like if you could just, if you, if it were technically possible and what did you wish, you know, existed? Hmm. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I think it, it, it kind of gets back to the vision and the framework is that I, I want to be able to um, control how my data is used right. all the time, easily. I don't want to have to write a program in order to do it, right? Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of used to in the physical world that, um, you know, we regularly control our privacy by, you know, closing a door and, you know, putting down a window shade and changing how loudly we're talking. And, and it's, it's easy. Um, but with our, our information privacy and our digital privacy, it's, it's not that easy. And I want a technology that, that makes it that easy. Right. Some of the, some of the proposals that I've, I've read throughout the years are 
you know, some sort of physical privacy shield that just blocks all tracking when you're out in public. So that 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 I thought was uh, I, I think that's called a bag that you put over your head. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, I, that was one of them. But I mean, that's completely one sided. That just blocks tracking. What if you do want the advertising yeah. tailored? So so it doesn't answer some of the right. And, and and that's also why I said control, not blocking. blocking. Um, so. Uh, you know, for the most part, I don't want to be tracked for advertising, but, but actually there are some products that when they go on sale, I want to know, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I want to have control. Right. It's so hard though. I mean, there are some critics to control and you're probably familiar with Professor Hartzog's uh, criticism of control as a tenet of, of privacy and, and how we've been inundated with too much choice, uh, right? And, and I think he's, he's right in, in commenting that, but I think there's also the other side to it. And I, and I wanna hear your thoughts. Um, it's because we built the tech that way to inundate as, a as opposed to truly honor preference. That's, that's my take of it anyway, but what do you think about you know, some of his, if you're familiar, and if not, I'm happy to, to talk about it further, some of his criticisms about consent as a, as a major tenet of privacy. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I'm, I kind of know his general argument. I, I, I haven't read his book. Um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but um, I, I think, you know, the, the criticism that, that, you know, it, it's too much work really to, you know, figure out all your choices, make all the decisions, exercise your consent. Uh, it's too much of a burden. And, and I, I completely agree with that. Um, and that's why I think technology can play a role in allowing us to be able to make those choices without being burdened. Um, right. But I think besides that, we need a legal framework where the default is such that if I haven't done anything, I'm not like completely exposing myself, which is right now the default um, in the United That's States. The opt -in, not opt out, exactly. And I, I agree with that. Uh, it's sad that in the US in particular, we, you know, un unless you've opted out or unless it's sensitive information, it, 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 if a company discloses it in fine print in their privacy policy, they're fine. <laughs> they're largely fine. Uh, and I, I do share your point of view about, I mean, I see both points of view. I see Woody's point, point about how companies are taking advantage of these pop-ups to just get whatever consent they think they need to get away with using our data. Um, but I, I don't, you know, I, there, there, there has to be a tech solution to it, right? Like this can't be, maybe not today, but there, there's a way to design technologies in a way that doesn't, um, that, that actually honors your, your true preferences and doesn't inundate you and overwhelm you with, with these choices, like you mentioned, with preset choices that you can set early on. Yeah, I mean, this, this idea that every website I go to gives me this stupid cookie banner, and half of them don't actually give me a choice that you just say, I agree, like, there's no way to say I disagree, or, or, or I love the ones that say, got it. What, what is it that I got? I, I don't know, but, but the, the only choice is got it to make it go away. Mm -hmm. um, so like that, that is not protecting anybody's privacy. It's, I don't even think it actually complies with any law, but somebody told these companies that if they put that on their website, they would comply with something, um, which yeah. I think is wrong. Yeah. Um, so yeah, th those are completely useless. Um, you know, we could design a better pop-up and there are some that are better, um, but really we don't want pop-ups. Um, you know, really I should be able to have a tool that set, where I can just say on all websites everywhere, this is what I allow and this is what I don't allow. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if I'm actually doing business with a company and they say, hey, 
we have this new feature um, and if you want to take advantage of it, like we actually need this piece of information, you know, like we are doing something with location uh, on a map. And if we don't know your location, then, you know, we can't draw a map for you. And then it makes perfect sense to me why they should have my location and I'll allow it. Right. But, you know, I shouldn't be bombarded with that the first time I come to their website, only when I'm there and I'm like, hey, how can I get in on this mapping thing? Right. So, so the, the, the defaults have to be designed differently as we have done then. Um, but that's exactly what do not track was, right? Like you, you don't track as a default. It, it's crazy that the, the tech was always there, but we just haven't adopted them and we're hoping that that, that changes in the future. Um, I, as you know, with each episode, we we have a theme which we've gone through, but we also have an explainer and breakdown portion towards the end. And I would love if you could break down privacy engineering for our students and technologists and, and, and privacy law certificate students. So, so we, have a, we have a mix of, of legal and technologists and, and compliance folks listening in. And some of them um, have commented that they like the explainer portion of the episode. And today we have, you know, we would love for you to break down privacy engineering for us. Uh, what is it? How would you explain it to someone who's not an engineer? Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And it, it's, um, I don't think there's one answer. Um, uh, so we actually started the first and I believe only privacy engineering master's program at Carnegie Mellon. Um, we started working on the program like eight or nine years ago. Um, and uh, and th that was the first question we asked ourselves. Okay, what, what is privacy engineering? What is this program? Um, we went and reached out to companies who uh, told us they wanted to hire privacy engineers, but we're having trouble finding them because you couldn't get a degree in it. And so we said to them, okay, well, what does it mean to you? What, what is a privacy engineer? Who are you trying to hire? Um, in many cases, they weren't entirely sure either, um, but we, we definitely got um, some ideas. So what we've put together, um, and this is totally evolving. Um, is, so a privacy engineer generally is somebody who has some technical skills um, and has uh, deep knowledge of privacy. And um, they are able to do that kind of problem solving and troubleshooting and, um, and figure out ways that they can build technology that will be respectful of privacy. Um, they, they have different roles in companies. Um, mm -hmm. There are some privacy engineers who are building new products and services from the ground up that are, that are really geared towards privacy. Um, there are some who are embedded in a larger team. They're the privacy expert on a larger team that's building something that may or may not have anything to do with privacy, but there's some privacy aspect. Um, there are some who are in a central organization in their company who are called in th at the end to kind of check to make sure that the product doesn't violate any privacy laws or any company policies. Um, there are some who are building privacy tools and developing guidance to be used throughout their, their company. Um, and, it, and the list goes on, but you can see it's kind of a range of different, different types of job roles that they have, um, but all very, very um, problem solving oriented and, uh, and are that marriage of technology and privacy. I would love to do a follow up and ask, how is it different from uppercase privacy by design? To, and, and to me, privacy engineering kind of drills down to the discipline that will get us to achieve those goals. So for those listening, we have privacy design, which is seven principles. Uh, and then we also have, you know, lowercase privacy by design, which is privacy a forethought. Um, how do you look at the intersection between those three? Yeah, yeah. Ideas? So I I think, um, you know, privacy by design, uppercase, uh, trademark, whatever, uh, um, is, is really more aspirational than anything else. Right. Um, right. The principles are aspirational. They're, they're what we'd like to achieve, um, but there isn't a lot of guidance directly into how to get there. Right. Um, and I think that's where the privacy engineers come in to kind of figure out how to actually make privacy by design happen. 
that's exactly what I was thinking. Privacy engineering gets us from the what to, you know, is the how to that what, to the aspirational what and goals that privacy by design principles um, have put forth those seven goals. Uh, but I also know like, you know, there's also lowercase privacy by engineering, which uh, is privacy of forethought. And, and do, you, do you see an intersection between that and privacy engineering? Um, yeah, so I think design is definitely part of engineering. Right. Um, so, so yeah, I think I think these things all all do um, intersect. And I, I don't I don't think we yet have a privacy engineering method or curriculum mm -hmm. that um, that you know all privacy engineers you know learn and get certified and follow um you know the IAPP has their their CIPT certification and I actually wrote exam questions for them last year um and uh it was it was interesting that among the the team of us who were writing those exam questions and trying to figure out like what is it that a privacy engineer really needs to know and um you know in some ways we felt like you were kind of putting the cart before the horse because we don't really all agree on what it is. Um, you know, the, the IAPP handed us a curriculum and yeah, you know, we're writing questions for it, but, but as we're writing them, we're going, really? I don't think a privacy engineer needs to know this. Like, I don't know that, but this other thing's not in your curriculum, you know? And so we pushed back and we iterated and, um, and they adjusted. Um, and I think, you know, every year when they when they redo the exam, it's going to continue to evolve for a while because we don't yet have that. Yeah, you know, this is the privacy engineering method. And is is part of the challenge? I mean, why is that? Is it because it's a nascent discipline, or or do you think it's because? I mean, like you said, the pri privacy engineers do different roles with different companies, and so it's going to be very hard to have a curriculum if you're supposed to be a front end developer versus, I mean, so maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, you maybe t explain to us why you think it, it, there's no consensus at this stage. Like what's contributing to the lack of consensus or definition? Is it um, the agency or, or are there other factors that you think um, affecting yeah, I, so, so part of it is definitely that it's in its infancy, um, that right. you know, the number of privacy engineers that exist in the world is still relatively small. Um, and uh, a lot of us are kind of making it up as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we don't really have um, too many um, kind of mathematical principles mm -hmm. of privacy engineering, like, you know, there are mathematical formulas that tell you how to make an airplane fly and a bridge like not collapse and things like that. We don't really have that for privacy at this point. Um, we, we also don't really have too many things or maybe any things that are a silver bullet that, um, you, know, you know, people have looked at differential privacy and they're like, ah, differential privacy will protect everything until you find out that there's a trade-off and the more it protects, then the less utility you get out of the data. Um, and so there isn't some magic formula that will give you both. You know, there's just like a knob to turn. And as you turn the knob, it's hard to even explain to people what the knob is doing in a way that anybody can understand. So um, that's kind of where, where we are with a lot of things. Um, you know, we, we have, we have this, you know, the fair information practice principles, you know, that came out of work from the 1970s and they're still good. Um, they're, they're great principles, um, but it doesn't tell you how to build the thing. No. And we're only starting to come up with the how, the methods, right? And, and you mentioned differential privacy is one of the you know, more widely known privacy enhancing technologies. And, and so, you know, is that the biggest part of the curriculum is understanding FIPS and then the PETs out there? Or is there more to it that privacy engineers should strive to learn or, or 
engineers or technologists who strive to become privacy engineers should, should strive to learn on their own if they're not in your course. <laughs> yeah, well, I can tell you at, at Carnegie Mellon, where we came down on the curriculum is um, we, we start uh, our students out with um, an overview of the privacy policy and legal landscape. Um, you know, we have history, uh, you know, things like FIPS, the privacy laws around the world, um, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we also um, uh, do some, some background in, in computer security um, because even though they're different things, it's, it's good to, to have some, some foundation there because they're often interrelated. Um, we, we do uh, privacy algorithms. Um, there's a variety besides, besides differential privacy, there are others as well. Um, so we teach them about that. Um, then um, in, in their uh, second semester, um, we have a class that I teach on usability um, because you know, we talk about informed consent. Um, when that's being done digitally, there are usability issues and how do we make sure that consent is actually informed. Um, and so they learn the basics of doing surveys and user studies. Um, and, uh, and more important than the fact that they learn how to do them, they learn how to critique them so that when a vendor comes to them and says, oh, we have the most usable whatever, you know, they can ask the right questions and, and say, wait, how do we know that our customers will really be able to use this thing? Um, so they learn that. And um, then uh, we, we talk about um, software engineering practices and how they apply to privacy. And we start giving them real world problems. Um, so those are really the core of our curriculum. Um, students specialize and they take programming classes or economics or whatever you know, they wanna take in addition. Um, but that's really the core. And then the final thing they do is a capstone project where we go to companies, they sponsor real world projects and the students spend 10 weeks actually working as a team of privacy engineer, engineers for a company trying to solve a problem. Oh, wow, that sounds lovely. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I can talk to you for hours, but it, it looks like we're coming down in time. I would love to give you, you know, the opportunity to share with us where, you know, we can find you if, if you want to be found online, if, you have, if any of the attendees have questions about privacy engineering, if not, completely fine. This is a privacy series after all. Uh, and if you have any closing words for us, um, you know, please uh, don't hesitate to share them with our attendees. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I'm easy to find online. My name is, is very Googleable, um, <laughs> uh, and I'm on Twitter um, as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm laurie.craner.org. You can find all my coordinates. Um, if you'd like to learn about our privacy engineering um, program at Carnegie Mellon, it's at privacy.cs cmu.edu. Uh, right now, um, there's information on our website about our full-time master's program, uh, but we're getting ready to actually roll out a, a part-time program and a, um, a short certificate program. Uh, so look, look for those coming out hopefully in, in the next few weeks. Cool. Thank you so much, Lori. I really appreciate you talking to us about privacy engineering and your vision for automated privacy consent. Uh, it's always lovely chatting with you. Uh, so thank you for, for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to the attendees. <laughs>